What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, August 20th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, UK winter squeeze. Average energy bills could jump up to 1714 Pounds, unbelievable. Next up, we'll come back here to the United States. House hearing reveals U.S. could experience 48 wind blade failures per year, according to this new hearing. Absolutely unbelievable. I will then quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets. We we shed it about two dollars off oil prices, currently down to seventy three seventy nine. And then I'll finish up with talking a little Apache. They are exploring a one billion dollar sale of Permian assets. That is according to our friends over at Reuters. And then we'll let you guys get on out of here and finish up your day. I am Michael Tanner. Stu is out on assignment, so I am rocking a solo show. So let's go ahead and dive right on. Winter squeeze. Average UK energy bills could jump to 1,714 pounds. Unbelievable. Energy bills across Britain are set to increase by 9% this winter, reading an average of 1,700 pounds. Pounds for the year for a typical household gas and electricity. This is brought to us by consultancy Cornwall Insights as they release their final forecast for the energy price cap for October 2024. I'm going to now read straight from the article. This energy price cap sets a maximum limit on rates and standing charges that suppliers can charge for variable standard tariffs. The forecast suggests that the cap will be set at about 1,700 pounds for the typical year at, for what is known as dual fuel households. And this would represent a 9% increase based on that current cap. So, you know, everyone's talking about price controls here in the United States. You can look across the pond at the UK and see exactly how it's working out. Not so much controlling the cost, are they? Now, people in the comments are going to argue, well, it is. They're just trying to keep up. Yeah, they're keeping up with inflation, which is absolutely crushing everybody. This official announcement will be made on August 23rd by OF. GEM. They also do see a modest increase for the price cap come January 2025. But a lot of this does come down with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Again, if you are in the UK, your electrical bills we know have gone up because a lot of your gas you're getting from Russia, you know, with with Nord Stream being knocked offline by the Ukrainian seals. And I'm talking about legitimate like seal like animals seals because we know in ukraine it wasn't well in ukraine they didn't say anything i did see something interesting you know the the whole yacht theory but that's now i'm, I'm digressing you know gas and electric prices have have you know come up in the uk they were at their some of their lowest points o- over the year back in february they've they've increased modestly now again as as we move into the summer months and people are beginning to to you know it's, it's a hot summer so there's that but UK is getting pounded. It's just bad energy policy. It comes back to bad energy policy and thinking you can control prices. You can't control prices. The free market will set prices where it needs to be. And if you attempt to cap them, you're going to end up with things like this. Well, we're going to increase it anyway, but and now there's all this back and forth. So even in the UK where they price control energy, it's still going up. So I wonder how those price controls on food is going to work. Um, but we'll, let's move on to the next one here. U.S. House hearing reveals U.S. could experience 48 win blade failures per year. This is pretty unbelievable. This all goes back to what happened in the vineyard wind development earlier this year as one of the blades fell off, scattering fiberglass and all this stuff everywhere. You know, basically what happened was people started freaking out. Two U.S. representatives, Representative Jeff Van Drew, a Republican from New Jersey, and Representative Scott Perry, a Republican from Pennsylvania, decided to hold a hearing to develop to, you know, basically determine the impacts of wind on the East Coast. And there were some really interesting things that came out. So here's a few quotes I'll read. This is from Representative Van Drew himself. These would be the largest wind turbines in the world. He's speaking of the Atlantic Shores Wind Project, which was approved in July. Basically, there's going to be 195 new wind turbines at 850 feet tall. These are off the coast of New Jersey. Quote here, back to the quote. These would be the largest wind turbines in the world. We will be an experiment for the world right here in your home at the Jersey Shore. Dozens of these turbines will be highly visible and maybe even audible, particularly in Bridgington. This is, you know, we've got uh, Amy DeSiblo. She's a board member for A. 
ACK or ACK for Wales, a Nantucket based environmental group who's opposed to offshore wind development. See, we've got something in common with these environmentalist groups. She testified that in 20 that in 2014, an offshore wind insurer estimated that out of 700,000 blades operating globally at the time, 3,800 failed each year from a range of causes, including lightning damage, human error, and manufacturing defects. She also estimated that there are 3,000 operating off the East Coast or 3,000 wind turbines operating off the East Coast. So we could see as much as 48 blade failures every year, like the one we saw in Nantucket. Pretty unbelievable. But this is also interesting. So with an average wind power or an average power of about 10 megawatts per turbine, it's going to take about 3,000 turbines to meet that offshore wind goal is what she said. The difference is what her analysis doesn't take into account is the fact you have three blades per wind turbine. So that number could be as high as 130 if we're actually talking about the, you know, scaling this up, you know, as we know, if this, you know, back what happened in Nantucket, it was pretty unbelievable. You had, you know, foam, fiberglass, epoxy being scattered all over the place. I mean, we also were, were, were talking about, you know, we were also talking again about what happened when it came to the whales. We know, you know, if you're a long time listener to the show, you know, this is the one thing I like about wind is that it's disintegrating and actually decimating the whale population. Get rid of them. I don't care. Clearly a joke, but let's go with it here, folks. You know, this is also interesting. You know, this DeSiblo, who's ahead of this, this this whale program, which we don't need, she brought a piece of the blade that actually washed up near her home to the hearing. She testified, and I'm reading now straight from the article, that the event has greatly shifted the public sentiment towards the offshore wind industry on Marsh's Vineyard. She said that comp community depends on tourism, which debris from the broken glass is impacting. We'll go down, and and we got to worry about the whales, I guess, a little bit in 2022. Save the Save Right Whales Coalition, which raises awareness for the impact of offshore wind development on the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale, documented a number of these unfortunate events. Nobody in the you know nobody wants to actually cover these, which I mean, rightfully so. I mean, this is just goes anti environmental. You're just now killing the whales. And again, offshore wind is horrible. I mean, there's very there's little good about offshore wind. It's inefficient. It's an eyesore. It's harmful to the environment. It's the exact opposite of trying to be environmentally friendly. Maybe it's renewable, but it's not really renewable from the standpoint of there's a lot of, you know, discharge capacity. It's only when the wind is blowing. I mean, it, offshore wind, in my opinion, is one of the worst forms of quote unquote renewable energy. Might as well. I'm more, if you had to rank what I think is like the worst renewables, offshore winds at the top. Onshore is pretty, pretty bad. I mean, solar is not as bad as this because at least solar, you can work around all other, you, you know, you can work around stuff. It's unbelievable. It, it's pretty unbelievable. These, you know, one of the quotes is these underwater pile driving hammer blows are compelled to do blasts from 155 milliliter howitzer canister cannon in the air. Such noise blasts are far too loud to be permitted anywhere near whale habitats. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable, especially building these things. You know, the Rand Acoustics LLC has produced two studies that find these impacts are in extensive when it comes to just, you know, noise pollution for these whales. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. If people, if people are in favor of offshore wind, you know, one, they even haven't done their research. Two, they're just ignorant and don't want to know and don't want to take the time. Three, don't really care. They're just in it for the money. So it's one of those three buckets when you're when you're offshore wind. I'm telling you, it's one of those three buckets. If you're into offshore wind, you fall into. You're ignorant. You just haven't done your research, which, hey, you, you didn't do your research. That's fine. But ignorance, bucket one, that's you refuse to do the research because you don't want to know the answer. Or your bucket number three where you're just, you don't care. You're just in it for the money. You don't like that oil and gas donates to the right side of the aisle. You're on the left side of the aisle. So I'm going to stand up for offshore wind Not because it's environmentally friendly, because I can make money off it. It's the worst kind of people. So with that, guys, let's go ahead and jump over into the finance section. Before we do that, let's go ahead and pay the bills as always. Thank you for checking out us on the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis, I say that in quotes, that you just heard is brought to you by said website. You can hit the description below for all links to the timestamps, links to the articles. Check us out on Substack. You can also, we're partnering up with our good friends, the Crew Truth, Ray Trevino, to offer some direct working interest into an awesome project right here in North Texas. So if you've ever wanted to start your oil and gas journey, want to figure out what's going on, go ahead and hit the link below or visit 
Invest in oil. Energynewsbeat.com. We will get you hooked up with all the information to start your journey. A market uh, not terrible today. We saw S and P 500 up about nine tenths of a percentage point. Nasdaq 1.3 percentage points. Two year yields flat. Ten year yields up about a tenth of a percentage point. Dollar index down about half a percentage point. Bitcoin up about 1.5 percentage points. Still below sixty thousand though. Crude oil not a great day. It was down about three percentage points or about two dollars a barrel. Seventy three seventy. Markets just reopened for their night trading session as we record this here about 5.30 central time. Brent oil down about 1.5 percentage points, 78.09. Natural gas spiked a little bit. It was, it was you know, and actually it was a decent amount. It was up about 3.5 percentage points, up to $2.24. That was up from about basically $2.10 what it was trading at before. I mean, the big thing going on, color me shocked if you heard this before, oil falling due to the fact that Gaza ceasefire talks and weak Chinese economy. I'm getting tired of having to read this headline. So again, what's really driving it? Again, the day-to-day moves in oil are a lot less important than what the trend is going. I mean, the trend is oil has stayed above $70. Why? Conflict going on in the Middle East and an assumption that demand will continue to rise even if the forecast is shed a little bit. I mean, yes, it's like inflation. Oh, inflation is at 10%, and now it's 6%. It's falling. Yeah, but we're still gaining overall. Inflation is still up at 6%. The slope is still non-zero, which, you know, people like to throw all that out. You know, we did have, you know, you know, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, not sure if that's a good or bad thing. He was out there today as we record this on a Monday in his latest diplomatic push by Washington to achieve this quote-unquote ceasefire. Hamas doesn't seem into it. Prime Minister Netanyahu says he reiterated Israel's commitment to the latest American proposal regarding the release of our hostages, taking into account Israel's security needs. That's really it. You know, the whole China demand stuff. You know, there is an overall China sell-off that's happening, but that's happening everywhere. As you see Kramer screaming behind me, you know, what will Jerome Powell do with this latest Fed meeting? It's the assumption that he's going to cut rates. The question is, is it a 25 basis points cut? Is it a 50 basis point cut? Only time will tell. The other interesting thing I saw today, oil producer Apache is exploring a $1 billion sale of Permia's assets, according to our friends over at Reuters, you know, they're, 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 they've opened up and hired, who is it, Truist Securities and, and, and Richardson Barr. We love them over there. We get a lot of the stories from them. We love them. They're, they've been hired to explore sale of properties that are spread across Texas and New Mexico, part of the Permian Basin, which is, you know, it really the, the Delaware Basin. They, they've kind of broken them up into different subsections, according to Reuters. Mainly, you've got the Northwest Shelf. Northern Shelf and the Central Basin Platform, both in New Mexico and Texas. This is, again, on the Delaware Basin side. These sites are around 22,000 BOE per day. About 60% of that is oil. According to Apache, their spokesman says they are actively managing its portfolio, declined to comment on any specific transactions. The quote from Patrick Cassidy, the Director of Corporate Communications. Oh, that's got to be a tough job, man. Ooh, pour one out for Patrick tonight, folks. You've seen us do multiple deals recently, including the Callan acquisition this year and targeted divestiture of its non-core properties. We didn't get anything out of RBC or Truist. Apache has come out and really said at the beginning of this year that they wanted to pay down about $2 billion of the debt that they assumed as part of that Callan acquisition. Earlier this year, Apache said it sold some non-core assets. Earlier this year, Apache did sell some non-core assets, both in the Eagleford and the Permian for about $700 million. So just trying to pay it all down. Things are getting spicy, folks. Apache's just trying to be the latest in that merger. I mean, this isn't a merger acquisition. This is trying to shed some non-core stuff. But hey, 22,000 barrels of oil, BOE, I should say, up for sale. So not bad. That's really all I've got, guys. Stu will be back in the chair tomorrow and Thursday. I'm actually going to be down in Houston doing some uh, business development stuff. So you'll get kind of a week of solo shows. But I'm sorry I'm subjugating you to Stu. You're probably thinking, you know, like to get back to Stu. Michael just sits here and screams, but that's okay. Thank you for everybody checking us out. Stu will again be back in the chair. And I will see you guys on the weekly recap and then see you back on Monday. For Stuart Turley and the entire Energy Newsbeat team, I am Michael Tanner. We'll see you next time. Thank you.